Hey, somebody's got to get the stick at notes. You have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. Today, our sponsor on The Professional Noticer is Kamado Joe Premium Ceramic Grills. The Kamado Joe, in all its sizes and with all its specialized tools, is the very best. But Kamado Joe is not just a line of products. Kamado Joe is what happens when a couple of friends who love to grill get serious about creating the world's best ceramic cooker. Their goal was simple, and that was that each product bearing the Kamado Joe name becomes a part, a trusted part, of exceptional grilling experiences for you. Check them out at kamadojoe.com or a dealer near you. Observations and answers. That's what we do here on Professional Noticer, and we like to have guests who can provide a little bit of both, observations and answers. And this week we have one of my favorite people. Um, it's a, an author that when I started reading, I mean, it's, it's like she, she, she writes potato chips, you know, because when I read her work, I, I can't put the book down. I keep reading another one and then another one and another one. And, um, and she is a columnist and author of two books, author of uh, The Majorettes Are Back in Town and Exploding Hush Puppies. How interesting does that sound to you? Please welcome Leslie Ann Tarabella. Hello, L.A. Well, hello. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, I'm, you already know, I'm going to impose on you to, to read one of your stories. And well, it's always a pleasure to be here at Wisdom Harbor. It's great. And by the way, we own a Komodo Joe grill, and so we love it. The, they are the best. Yes. They really they are. are the best. Very good. And, you know. They're it, very heavy. We had to have help putting it, not that I helped, but, you know. Right. We had to have other strong people come help put it in place, but they're solid. They're we, great. We had friends at the house yesterday, and they were looking at some of the hurricane damage from last year, and they said, what about your Kamado Joes? And I said, well, they are. A hurricane can't move them. Yeah. No, you know? that's good. So, yeah, yeah, so you made me hungry talking about grilling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, see, now you need to do something about grilling, because I bet, I bet Bob— is he is he your outdoor He's, guy? He only cooks if there's an element of danger. Yeah, he likes the challenging, scary things, which is actually a story I have today for you about. He did something really scary. Really? Yeah, it's scarier than grilling and singeing your eyebrows off. Well, yeah, now, you know, there's a difference <laughs> in grilling today and in grilling the way our dads used to do it. Because I'm telling you, the lighter fluid today, <laughs> it's just water. I mean, yeah. it's some kind of water, but because you remember our dads oh, yeah. years ago. Whoosh. Yeah, yeah, they they pour that lighter fluid on there. Says, Stand back, everybody, and then throw a match toward you, whoom, and yeah. it's, well, there's the mushroom yeah, cloud coming from the out. Andrews backyard, yeah. and, <laughs> and and so that that was made of something different. It was it was fully fueled. Totally. And yeah. your food tasted like that a little bit. So I'm glad we don't have that much anymore. Yeah, it did. It did kind of Bob taste. has one of those electric, it, it heats up. It's like a little prod thing. Right. And it, it heats charcoal that way, ignites it. You could also use that as a brand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like I said, any amount of danger, he's there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, we are all, all men have that little boy matches Right. Fire kind of thing. Even though your mother's told you not to. Yeah. Especially then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just makes it, it, may, it makes it more appealing. Yeah. Bless your hearts. Even if we're not told, <laughs> not, even if we're not told not to do it, we can sense when we're doing something we shouldn't do and it, it prods us. But you know, after raising two boys, they're not fully grown yet. They think they are. But I love it that boys and men have an element of danger. 
And I think that's just how God made them. They're supposed to be wild. They're supposed to jump off furniture that they're not supposed to climb on to start with. That's just how they're wired. And I think, you know, my dad always told me about my boys. He said, just let them be boys. Just let them be boys. And that's what he meant. You know, they're meant to run and play and do dangerous things and frighten their mothers, which they did plenty of. So I, I just kind of enjoy watching them within reason. Yeah, well, yeah. We, you know, we have two boys, too. And mm -hmm. so yeah, Polly was a, had a sister. And Polly didn't grow up with boys. Yeah. And so Polly would get kind of freaked when they would start wrestling and, you know, and I, and I would say, Polly, that's how they love each other. It is. You know, that's, and, and then, but they're getting hurt. Well, you know, you, had, you hadn't been wrestling until somebody cries. That's so. right. Well, and then they're the ones that grow up to lead us into battle, and they're fearless, and these men run these big companies. Not that women can't do that, by the way, but, you know, they're just more wired because they're bold, and these, these men will join the military because they have this fearless attitude that they want to go out and do these adventurous things and protect our country, and God love them for it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, that they, they are— Fearless. There's Adam with a shark. You yeah, know? you can't miss that. And so that's pretty fearless. Ugh. Good grief. But yeah. hey, you know, you and I have gotten to spend some time together lately because uh, with Wisdom Harbor mm -hmm. launching at wisdomharbor.com and the app mm -hmm. and everything with the app on iTunes. Uh, you, you are a contributor. Yeah, we're pulling some content together. Yeah, it's exciting. So part of and wisdom. And it's fun just to tell stories, and you and I are both natural storytellers, and I think if we didn't stick to a schedule, which you're very good at sticking to schedules, but I think we would just end up talking forever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, def definitely. Story on top of story. And, you know, it it is amazing to me how many things that you and I have in common. Mm -hmm. We could have been like brother and sister or something. I think at least distant cousins somewhere down the road. Yeah, the Alabama connection and the dad. and Dad. Both yeah. our dads were ministers of music. Yes, and they both attended the same college. Both went to the same college. college yes. You have two boys. We have two, two boys. boys. Yeah. Yes, you, so you write. I try to. Yeah. So It's all know. there. And, and we, we ended up knowing a lot of the same people, too. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I mean, we kind of orbited each other there for right. a while. But I, I read your stuff before I ever met you. When mm -hmm. I took the um, the books home, when you, you came in and did a blue plate special mm -hmm. with us, and when I took the books home that you had given me that day, Polly said, oh, I've already read that one. Oh, isn't that you know? nice? <laughs> so the majorettes were back in town. She'd already read. Yeah. And I just— I. I love I love your work, but you work on uh, on something that scares me, and oh. that is a deadline. <laughs> yes. I mean, I love deadlines. I love uh, the the whooshing sound they make when they pass me. <laughs> so, but you're you know you work you work as a columnist right. as well as an right. author. Yeah, and that's hard because, you know, it's not just a deadline once a month. It's a deadline every single week. So it's like having a term paper due every week, which, you know, why am I doing this to myself? This is hard. But usually I can work far enough in advance where I've got something coming for the next week or two. But there have been times I've been thinking, oh, help me. I have no idea what to do. And it just, you know, you have to pull on these ideas that are circling and for, you know, a very good reason. I have a great sense of uh, an imagination that works full speed a lot, right? And that helps me a lot. And I've also learned to listen to other people and other conversations and and things that are interesting to other people or bothering other people, which is very funny because right now I'm working on one that's about does your toilet paper go over the top or under over. when it rolls? Over. And it's because well, thank you. I'm an over person too. But I just I got this idea because you know everyone talks about this eventually. But it, there was online there was this passionate conversation about it with all these comments. And I thought, really? People are really concerned about this. So I'm coming up with a story about that. That's so. awesome. What do, what do you do in the in the off week that that you sit down and you go, I got nothing? I mean, <laughs> what what well what process have you worked out? And I think you know, people are really interested in that because I think there's a writer in everybody. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that maybe doesn't practice as much as you and I do. Right. But they are curious about what do you do when yeah. you don't know what to write? Well, creativity is one thing, and forced creativity is a different thing, which always is painful. You know, you hate to force a story out, but my husband always jokes, Bob, and says that if you're having a dry spot, just think about whatever I made you mad about the last time and write about that. Because poor guy, he, he gets a lot of stories about him, you know, how he he doesn't like the way I load the dishwasher or, you know, um, this story where, I'll give you a hint, he cut my hair. So it was, yeah, but it, so you go to family a lot, you go to friends. And like I said, I just keep ideas going constantly. And I have a, a list on my computer of ideas. And sometimes I look at the idea and think, oh, that's dumb. And the next thing I know, oh, this is a great story. So... So have you so have you sat down and and thought I don't know what to write? Oh yeah, all the time. I, coming up with ideas, I think the hardest part because now that I've done it so many years, I've done it about 10 years now, right. every single week. I think the writing part isn't as hard as it used to be and it goes quickly. It's the coming up with the idea and also the the way I'm going to attack and approach the story. Right. But it's just a 550-word story, but it's got to be there for the newspaper every week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so what is the first step? What's your first step when you realize, I, I kind of don't, what is your go-to? What If you don't know what to do, what do you do? Well, you keep notes of ideas, and that way you always have that to pull on. And when it comes to you, just sit and write as much as possible. And I tell people that like to write, they always ask me, how do I get started with the story? I I have the idea, but I'm stuck on how to write it. What I tell them is I say, pretend like you're calling up your best friend on the phone and tell them, hey, I've got something to tell you. Because when I first started writing, I would tell people, I'd rather really call you and tell you what I'm going to say rather than write it. But... It's um, just a conversational style that I have. So I just pretend like I'm talking to my best friend. Okay, you know, you aren't going to believe this, but. I think that's great yeah. advice. Yeah. And I think um, even when I was younger in high school and college, I was always the one at the lunch table saying, come here, you're not going to believe this. You know, let me tell you what happened. And it was always a story. And I'm guessing you were probably the same way. Yeah, I was not the class clown. I was like the class wit. You know, because the class clown is the guy who runs naked across the football field (laughs) in freezing weather. I was the one who talked him into doing it. (laughs) I love it. The mastermind. But I, I, I I think that's great advice on how to how to get Mm -hmm. get started. You know, I was I was in a position a number of years ago writing uh, a fiction piece Mm -hmm. every month, every month. And I, and man, there was one time I never will forget, and this taught me a lesson, but I got stuck. And I mean, I was stuck at the first. I, I hadn't written a single word. Mm-hmm. And have I told you this before? Mm-hmm. Seems like I, I tell, so. tell somebody recently, but I, I got stuck. And, and so, I, I mean, I sat there for like an hour mm-hmm. and I could not think of anything to write. Well, this that I was writing, these were columns that eventually became uh, uh, Return to Sawyerton Springs. And I so it was about the same town and the same kind of cast of characters. And, and so, I mean, I was running out of time. And so one of the characters in the book uh, was Jenny Williams. And so Jenny was Billy Pat's wife and... Um, he owned a car dealership, and 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 I wrote down. I, I wrote, Jenny Williams was mad. Okay, and I thought, what is she mad at? And I, and so I picked the easiest target, which was her husband. You know, <laughs> and and I and I, I kind of wrote down something that he had done when, when he, when he left, and what she thought she should have said, and you know what she would have said if she'd had a minute to think about it. And and so then I, she's doing stuff around the house, and she's getting fired up, and more fired up at him, and madder at him, and madder at him, and. And then at some point she starts thinking, well, but well, he does do this, and then and then she's ramping down, and, fi- and finally he comes home, and 
you know, she hugs him and he <laughs> never knew. Yeah, and that's the way I ended the story is he never knew she was mad at him to begin with. And she was furious the first half of the day and ramping down. But golly. And so I, I guess I learned that you can build around anything, but you can't build around nothing. Right. You've so got to put you something on the paper to start paper. with. And usually a lot of the times, you know, your first draft is just thoughts and it's all jumbled. And a lot of times I'll even go back and rearrange my paragraphs because it doesn't come out in the right order sometimes the first time because you're just throwing your thoughts down. But I encourage writers to go back and just write, you know, the idea is hard, writing is the easy part, and then editing is the other part that's hard. People don't want to take out anything, but you've got to take things out. It's like, yeah, it's like, these are your kids, you know. Yeah. It's like you're telling me my kids are ugly, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, my gosh. The, yeah, the, it, I have a um, kind of a hate-hate relationship with editors. So Yeah, when they do it, it's harder. But when you do it and remove all those words that aren't needed, it helps. Keep well, you know, tight. when we were writing the things with uh, for Wisdom Harbor, doing the In Other Words mm -hmm. and the Betcha Didn't Know docs, um, you know, we have to keep those fairly tight. Those are like 750 right. to 850 words yeah. because, number one, it costs a lot of money to have them edited mm -hmm. with the green screen stuff. And, I mean, when we if we send them out, if Matt, you know, because Matt, he, he's, he's like, man, he's doing everything he can do. Right. And so we're at, we have to get some other people involved sometimes. And, and so... And, and, you know, there's the attention span, too. And That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It, people's attention spans, and even I find it in myself, which is awful, because, you know, I'm a writer, but I'll look at a story, and visually, especially in a newspaper where you can see all of the text, if it's too long, I want to skip over it if I'm in a hurry. You know, it has to be something that really interests me and pulls me in to get me to read a longer story. Right. And that's just the world right now. Even podcasts, you know, I'll, I'll start listening to one and and— you know, I want to jump to something else, and our attention span is awful, and I guess we have ourselves to blame for that, but... I guess, I guess, but then, you know, the the number one podcast in the world, Joe Rogan, and his podcast would be two and a half hours. Yeah, I just can't listen to that. I don't care who it is. My, if my pastor goes 10 minutes too long, I'm thinking, I'm dying. What have I done wrong? <laughs> you know, it's just we're, we're conditioned now to just get on with it and move. And so that's, my word count is very small now for the newspaper, it's only 550 words. And it sounds like a lot to people that don't write, they panic if they think they have to write that much, but to me it's hardly anything at all. So I have to keep thinking, what is my main idea? What am I trying to say here to the reader? Right, And so that's I get, like two typewritten pages, right? Yeah, two, or one and, one and a quarter, sometimes it just depends. I yeah. use very big, fancy words sometimes because I'm so intelligent. Don't there you know? There you go. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> long, long words. What were, what, you know, having become a writer, what, uh, you, you obviously were, were a reader. Oh, yes. Okay. So what words did you mispronounce in your head when you were reading as a mm -hmm. child, you know, and then you found out later, oh, that didn't. That's so funny you say that because I did see something the other day that said if you mispronounce a word, it's because you're smart enough to read it, but you just haven't been around other people that are smart enough to say it correctly. Huh. But the one word I can't ever figure out which way to say it is when I read the label and it's the fake sweetener, aspartame, aspartame, aspartame. Uh, yeah, aspartame. Yeah, I can't ever get that right. I'm like, how do you say that Aspartame. <laughs> I don't know what Here, is. would you like some aspartame in your cup? It, it goes back to the ice cream commercial that says, if you can't pronounce it, it's not in our ice cream, you know? Wow. So I shouldn't be drinking that anyway if it has fake sugar in it. But I that remember always bothered reading me. a Lassie book when I was a little kid, and Lassie's mom drove a four-door Seedon. <laughs> I had never heard of a sedan. What kind of car was a sedan? Because nobody said sedan no. where I was in, in the South. Right. Nobody called anything a sedan. I'm reading a four-door sedan. Lassie what? was a dog. How does it, How does Lassie's mother drive a car? Lassie's well, mother's a dog. Lassie, it's like June Lockhart. <laughs> oh, you know? the, the like, owner mom. <laughs> yeah, the owner. It's, just, <laughs> so it's like that Subaru commercial where the dog's driving down the road. Yeah. Well, that's like the Nancy Drew books. They always said her hair was Titian, Titan, Tatine. What, what did, I didn't know what that was, so I'd never heard that. What was it? 
I think it was a brownish red or Tashin Titan. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> T-shirt, I don't know. I think. <laughs> and I would read military books, and there would be a colonel. Yes, <laughs> that's hard. Colonel. That's hard to spell, even. And of course, I'm guessing that you did your reading like I did from the church library in the middle of. Church. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was good. I was good. I, I would get the books, and I was good at doing this in church. <laughs> and it was inside the hymnal or the yeah. Bible. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, my mom, you know, my dad mm-hmm. was sitting in one of the king chairs, yeah. you know, yep. there while the preacher's going. And, and your mom and was my where my mom, mom was playing the piano oh, or the okay. organ. My mom was in the choir. Yeah. yeah. And so... Yeah, they keep so just like very good. And yeah. we never got to sit with our parents in church. No, no, never. I know. Never. My mom never played the piano, but she was glad. She said that would have just been a disaster if she would have been the pianist for my dad's choir. But they gave me piano lessons for eight long years. And I still cannot play that. That was just not my gift. But he knew he was gonna make me into his pianist. And I just couldn't handle it. I think I, I, think I took uh, piano for like six years. I never got out of John Thompson book one. I was <laughs> determined I was not going to play. And they were determined I was going to. But this, you know, this manifested itself in several other ways in my family. I remember the big liver standoff of 1967. <laughs> you know, when I'm, you know, and my dad's, you're going to sit at this table <clears throat> until you eat those two bites of liver on your plate. Uh, and and so, you know, it was Sunday. It was Sunday lunch. And so 2.30, I'm still sitting there. 3.30, I'm still sitting there. And, you know... Oh, and when 4 it gets 30, cold, they've got to go back to church. Yeah, that's right. right. And so, Baptist, you're going at so, night. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to sit here while you guys go to church. Yeah. And, and so I, mean, I, I, I won the big liver, big liver standoff. Shame on you. Yeah. Yeah. See, there's a story right there. All right. So, it, but it's uh, what, what night was choir rehearsal for you guys? Well, we had youth choir Sunday afternoon. We did too. And it was so fun. You know, we lived here right at the beach, and we would all, after Sunday morning church, we'd run home, eat with our families for lunch, and then we'd take off to the beach. But choir practice was so fun, we would run home, take showers, and come to church with wet hair just to go to choir practice because it was all our friends. And we had like 40 to, anywhere 40 to 60 kids up there, and we just had a ball. What church was that here? That was in Pensacola. That was oh, at okay. Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, okay. actually. Yeah, yeah. But... um. It was it was fun. We had a good time, and then we'd get to go. We'd sing at night, and then sit in the pews and pass notes and kick each other. And sure. Then we'd all go out for pizza afterwards. It was fun. Yeah, I I loved. Um, you know, I liked my parents being up there away from me in church because I I was always. I was good at making the kids around me laugh, <laughs> and their parents were in the choir, and so their parents would be watching them and giving them dirty looks, and I would just be. You know, just very innocent looking, <laughs> and but I would I got I I was really good at like singing hymns in a different voice and <laughs> and changing the words of him. You know, like on Easter morning when he sang uh, from the grave he arose, and then I added with a mighty booger in his nose, <laughs> and and that really got my friends. I mean, my friends were on the floor, and I was just like, you know. <laughs> Why are they acting up? I don't know, Mom. And <laughs> but I, you know, so. And you probably threw the airplane, paper airplanes out of the balcony, and. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I shot a guy with uh, with a rubber band, one time <laughs> in church, and I and it was a bald headed guy, and he always <laughs> said Amen, and I mean he was just saying it thirty times a service, and so I shot him, and it was a good shot. But I didn't mean to shoot him right when you say an amen, but he went, hey, what? Like that. <laughs> and and everybody in the church can you know, look, and I and I was scared I was gonna get caught at that one. Because, but thankfully the rubber band went down behind him. He didn't know what it hit him. <laughs> well, we had a man that would always sit in the choir and fall asleep, and whenever he would wake up, he would just shout, Amen. Whenever he woke up. And so everyone was watching him, and one day the pastor was preaching about Things happen to you slowly over time, and you just don't notice it. And he 
equated the story to the frog being cooked. Slowly, you turn up the heat, you turn up the heat, and the frog doesn't notice. And finally, he shouted and slammed his head, hand on the pulpit and said, and that frog was cooked. And he woke up and said, amen. <laughs> and, just, and everyone in the, in the congregation just cracked up. But My mom used to kind of get jokes late. And <laughs> and so I have this great memory of the of the pastor, you know, doing something and the congregation would laugh. And then a couple minutes later, my mom would laugh <laughs> over at the piano and the pastor would go, well, thank you, Joyce. And everybody just thought that was so funny. <laughs> thank you very much. That's yeah. funny. So well, what are you going to read to us? Well, speaking about little stories of and husbands, this did not take much imagination because this is a true story. Okay. I was just going through a very difficult summer a few years ago. My dad was sick and it gets so hot here in South Alabama, and I was boiling hot. And you know, when you need to have your hair cut for ladies, a lot of times they'll say, oh, yes, we can take you three weeks from now. Well, I'm kind of an impatient person, not even kind of, just very impatient. And I thought, I just don't want to wait three weeks. So, right, Let me just say before you read this, yes. this is not on Bob. This is well, not on Bob. I don't care how he cut your hair. I don't know. I don't know. care what he did to know. it. This is not <laughs> on Bob because we'll see about that. you were in control of this. All right, go ahead. Nah, we'll see. All right. Like most Southern ladies, I place a great deal of importance on the appearance of my hair. It's our crowning glory and the actual place where we snuggle our real crowns and tiaras. So we may take great care in making it as big, poofy, smooth, straight, sleek, flippy, and curled as possible, depending on the trend of the moment and the humidity levels, of course. That's why I surprised myself, my husband, and everyone else when one afternoon this past August, I stood in the kitchen and asked my husband to cut my hair off. Just like that. If I give you the scissors, will you cut three inches off my hair? Bob said, sure. He took the scissors and cut five inches off. Oops. Carefully placing each bundle of hair on the kitchen counter. The man knows no fear. I wasn't taking any medications, nor was I tipsy or suffering from a head injury. I hadn't been bitten by a spider or baked too long in the sun. I don't know what in the tarnation got into me. I just wanted my hair cut right then and there, and I knew Bob was good for a spontaneous challenge. There wasn't any big drama before or afterwards. I just called my girl at BB's Beauty Barn the next morning and made an appointment for her to even up a few spots. Once she heard uh, what happened, suddenly I got in. She took pity on me. She was the kind that said she'd heard crazier stories about women nuttier than a fruitcake who whacked their hair off in the middle of a party or even moments before their wedding. Who's crazy now? She was impressed by my calmness, and I just slid back in the big spinning chair and let her finish the job. Southern ladies rarely keep the same hairstyle very long. Our beauticians stay booked, and whether our dues are short and sassy or long and sleek, we purchase more appliances, accessories, styling gels, sprays, and goop, and glistening serums than people in any other place on the planet. <laughs> short and better. For now. I usually wear my hair long, but have finally recognized a pattern of chopping my hair off every seven to eight years. It has little to do with the changing styles, but instead reflects my changing life. If I can't control my children, husband, dog, parents, politics, or terrorists, I can always control my hair, minus the humid days. All women are busy, but Southern ladies are taught to look pulled together in the midst of the storm. We were taught to hold our stuff together while everything else around us goes crazy. Quit that blubbering and put on some lipstick, our mamas whispered. To us, looking good isn't vanity, it's dignity. And if Southern women are anything, we are a dignified and determined bunch. You can burn our houses, steal our horses, and destroy our crops, but we'll rip the curtains down and make a ball gown that matches the color of our eyes just to see you sweat. And our hair will look fabulous while we do it. My husband did just what I asked for once, and the new hairdo looked just like I envisioned. I gained a much-needed rush of control, trust, and bravery, all rolled into one haircut, and the price was just right. That is great. <laughs> that was great. Thanks. 
Uh, you know that, and it's taken me three years to grow it out because it was so crazy. But <laughs> well, the, the story was worth it. Thanks. The yes. story was worth it. Yeah, you got to sacrifice your hair sometimes for the art. You yeah, know? I don't know if Bob's couple of days after that was worth it, but yeah. you know, to him. But uh, he was kind of scratching his hair, thinking, "What does she mean?" I mean, he knew I was serious, but I, I still say that's know, not on him. Well, I've always told him. Things would go a lot more easily between the two of us if you just feared me a little bit more. And I don't think he does. I don't think he uh, fears me quite enough. So, um, but we have a great marriage. Well, where where can uh, people get the books? Where can they get in touch with you? They can find me on my website, which is a blog, and it's leslieandtarabella.com. And you can find links there to my books, and it'll tell you where some of the bookstores are in our local area that carry them. Any Barnes and Noble should be able to get these books for you. Um, the Majorettes are back in town right now. Is um, not available through Barnes and Nobles, but it is online at Amazon. Okay. And if you're living locally in our South Alabama area, Page and Pallet Bookstore has it. Gotcha. So okay. you can do Barnes and Nobles, Amazon. But your local bookstores can definitely order the Exploding Hush, hush Puppies if you ask them. Okay. All right. And we'll put we'll put links to okay. you on the, the show notes that and everything. That sounds great. Thank you for being here. And thank you uh, for uh, the contributions you're making with Wisdom Harbor. People are just, they're loving you. Well, I am so excited about your plans. You've got vision. You've got creativity. And you've got a freezing cold studio, by the way, if anyone's interested. <laughs> I, I've learned to bring a sweater when I come visit you, but yeah. it's just the South Alabama humidity is getting to us this time of year. But you, you've got big things coming with a Wisdom Harbor, and I think people are going to just love it. There's something for everyone there. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. And thank you for being here. Oh, anytime we can sit around and tell stories, All it's right. my pleasure. Thanks. Well, we will. I'm Andy Andrews. The professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing the tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme, written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Manual typewriters, provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by ghostwritersinthesky.com. Does your business need content for social media, but you don't have the time to write it? Do you need a personal letter composed but can't generate the emotion required? Call us. We are English and journalism majors with a small plane. We will travel to you. We are the ghostwritersinthesky.com. Love letters, rejection letters, thank you notes, or doctoral papers. We work fast and do it while heading your way in our personal Piper Cub. Ghostwritersinthesky.com. We work high. <laughs>